From Kern Government Television, welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting, originating from the County Administrative Center located at 1115 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California. Kern County's vision is to create and maintain a customer-centered county government designed to garner the confidence, support, and trust of the people we serve. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Good afternoon. Welcome to the PM session, 2 PM session of the Kern County Board of Supervisors here on the 26th day of June, 2018. Uh, the board will reconvene. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Supervisor Gleason. Here. Supervisor Scribner. Here. Supervisor Maggard. Here. Supervisor Couch. Here. Supervisor Perez. Uh, before we hear a report on actions taken in closed session, we're gonna, I'm going to turn to our CAO, Ryan Alsop, who is going to introduce Mac Evansia to us, who is one of our new Employees. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Real quickly, members of the board, I just wanted to take the opportunity to welcome and introduce you to our um, new uh, chief information technology officer. We've been uh, in a recruit, uh, recruitment uh, mode on that position for a while and just recently hired uh, Mr. Mac Avancina. Uh, he comes to us from NBC Universal, where he handled a whole bunch of different IT um, uh, issues uh, over the course of uh, uh, many years, I think 17, 18, 19 years he was there uh, down in Los Angeles. So we're happy to have him here. And Mac, if you wouldn't mind just standing up and wave, appreciate it very much. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Look forward to your leadership and working with you. Uh, now we'll go to our city, our county council, Mark Nations, for a report on actions taken in closed session. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The board met in closed session on items 65, 66, and 67 after the morning session, and there are no reportable actions coming out of either or any of those three closed sessions. Thank you. Thank you. We're next going to deal with our consent agenda. Consent items are considered to be uh, routine in nature by staff, and they are recommended to be voted on uh, all in one motion. They are indicated on the, the agenda with a CA proceeding just above the item number. I'll go through what those items are. If you have a question about an item on consent in a moment, I'll give you an opportunity to ask your question, and then it'll be at the discretion of a board member as to whether or not they want to pull that item for separate consideration when the vote is actually taken. So beginning on page two of the afternoon uh, agenda, items four and five are on consent. On page three, all the items six through nine. Page four, items 10 through 15. Page five, items 16 through 23. And on page six, items 24 through 30. Are there any members of the public who have a question about any item that is on consent? I don't see anyone. Okay, colleagues, uh, do you have, would you like to pull anything or do you have a comment or is there a motion to proceed with the consent calendar, approve it as presented? Motion on consent. Thank you, is there second. a second? We have a motion and a second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved, four ayes, one absent, Supervisor Perez. Thank you very much. We offer an opportunity every time we meet for the public to make comment to us about any matter that is not otherwise on our agenda. Is there any member of the public here this afternoon who would like to make a comment to us about an item not otherwise on our agenda? Yes, ma'am. And somebody in the back, could you please make your way towards the front and we'll recognize both of you. Good afternoon, ma'am. We give you two minutes to uh, make a comment to us about what's not on the agenda, so could you please give us your name and pr proceed with your comments? Yes, sir. My name is Susan Kulstad, and I represent the Bakersfield Tunnel to Towers Foundation. We are having a 5K run event and walk at Riverwalk Park on September 8th of 2018. The run raises money for catastrophically injured veterans and first responders to build their own smart homes. The veterans and first responders they're catastrophically injured, have lost limbs in the line of duty, and therefore need adaptable homes. They choose the property, they choose the design, they choose everything for the homes. Each home averages about half a million. Ma'am, could you tell us again the name of the organization? Steven Siller, Tunnel to Towers Foundation. Very good. Headquartered in Staten Island, New York. Oh, very good. So it, it, uh, your walk or run is on September the 18th, and uh, do you have information that you could give us? Yes, I have two posters for you all, and I also have some more portable cards if you'd okay. like those. Very good. If you could leave those there on the counter, our clerk will make them part of our record and we'll have them available if people call and ask about it. Thank I you. have a 10 more cards, contact information, email, everything is on the cards if you need more. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you so much. I Thank appreciate you. y'all starting. Good luck with your event. Thanks for what you do. Thank you so much. Oh, can you reach that, Kathy? 
Yes, could you give us your name for the record, please? Ryan Johnson. Ryan, good afternoon, Mr. Johnson. What's your comment, please? A group of professional circulators came out here to circulate the current uh, regulation and taxation of Cannabis Act 2018, and uh, the company has not paid us for any of their signatures that we were under contract to gather for them. Uh, we have s about six of us here with a total of about $20,000 owed for that petition for signatures that were gathered uh, for that petition, and we're just here. I don't necessarily know what I'm doing here, just bringing it to you guys. So, so somebody hired you, I want to make sure I refer to the right place. Somebody hired you to try to raise, to find signatures for a petition? Correct. Was it the County of Kern that hired you? No. Who, um, who, who hired as, you, sir? As far as the research that I've done on my own, Ben Eilenberg was the attorney that wrote the language, and I believe he's also the one who's paying for the signatures. Okay. The name Willie Rivera also came up when I did research as far as uh, huh. who's okay. collecting them. It's a committee for safer neighborhoods and schools. Okay. So somebody hired you and they haven't paid you? Right. Mr. Nations, is there any uh, place in the county that we would direct him? I don't believe he has a filing against the county because the county didn't, isn't involved in the transaction. What's your take, sir? That's, that's correct. Um, your recourse is with the organization that hired you, uh, that's sponsored by Mr. Eilenberg. I believe their legal counsel is a local attorney. His name escapes me at the moment. What is it? Gabe Godinas. Dave Godinas? Gabriel Godinas. Okay. You can find him in the local, local bar. Um, okay. That, he, he, by the I, way. I don't, I, don't think you, I don't think you mean no, no. a drinking establishment. <laughs> bar I think you mean the <laughs> bar association. The bar association. Yes, Sorry about I think that. that's what you mean. Yeah. Um, Mr. Godinas is a, a, a fine citizen of our community. He, I think he is. He's a member of the bar. Well, anyway, th that, that p particular. Uh, petition was in fact submitted to elections yesterday with over 16,000 signatures. So it sounds to me like the committee owes you what they offered to pay you. So I would contact Mr. Godinas. Okay. We, we only brought it here because it was a issue regarding political sure. work. Yeah. Well, it, it was at their instigation, not ours. So I think your, your argument is with them. Thanks for coming forward. Thank you. Do you have another comment, sir? What is your name, please? Yeah, um, my name is Aaron Anderson, and it's a, it's along the same lines. Um, I mean, at the top of the petition, it says the county council of Kern County has put this forward to you guys. So, I mean, <clears throat> it kind of involves the county in some aspect, I would say, because we are presenting that to the public. Mm. Let me just clarify one more time for you. Mr. Anderson, was it? Yes. Okay. What, is the county council involved at all in an effort to raise signatures for Mr. Eilenberg's initiative? No, what, what he's referring to is the government code requires the county council's office to prepare the ballot title and summary, which, is include, which by the elections code is required to be included on every page of the petition. Mm -hmm. So th that's what he's referring to. Right, okay. but uh, Mr. Phil Ganong also put a, a marijuana petition on the ballot, and his was not presented in, in you know, as such as saying the county council has pre prepared this for you guys. We were saying this to the public and showing that the county council did this, and I mean, I think there's some kind of misrepresentation there because. Yeah. So, so you, you, were, you were explaining to the public that it was the county who was urging you to go get these signatures? The, well, I mean, it says right at the top of the page. We would pointed out, hey, look, the county council, oh, well, who is this put out by? The county council. I'm sure every other person going door to door was doing the same thing. Did so, somebody suggest that you explain it that way? Uh, we were suggested uh, to explain it the way as keeping marijuana stores away from our schools. And that's what the people were saying door to door. So a lot of people did not really even know what they were signing. Hmm, that's interesting. Well, uh, but as, as, as Sierra had explained, the, the county of Kern has nothing to do with that effort. 
Well, I, I understand, but you know, one of the people that worked on this campaign, he's owed $4,500 and him and his wife and kid are about to go homeless because they can't pay their rent. Mm. And they could have been working as a, you know, independent contractor on another job and actually getting paid and being able to pay their rent rather than following this to the end and, and not getting paid paid so it's it's a very sad situation a lot of people are you know left in dire straits with this it, any other names associated with this that, that uh, duped you guys into doing this uh, Fernando Jara uh, okay so. okay well all right supervisor Mr. Jason Chairman, could, could you Mr. Mr. Anderson could you please give your uh, the, uh, the CAO over there could you give him your name address and phone or contact information because I want to uh, contact you afterwards. If we could do that, I'd okay. appreciate that. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Are you from Bakersfield, Mr. Anderson? Uh, no. I, I I I would like not to comment on that at the okay. moment. Okay. Fair enough. A lot of people thank came you. here from outside the state, as I understand it. So, Mr. Alsop, there is who you give your information to. Okay. Mr. Alsop, is your microphone off? I'd, I'd like this gentleman's contact information not to be made public. So. Okay. Uh, sir, are you here to talk about something that's not on our agenda either? Uh, I'm, I'm actually here to talk, share my personal story in the same... How, how, how many more people want to talk about this issue? I don't think I'm with anyone else. Are you the last one, sir? From my group, yes. Okay. Uh, All right. So why, why don't you go ahead? Are, sir, are you raising your hand too, sir? Uh, different issues. Oh, okay. So we'll, we'll give you a chance in just a second. So what is your name, sir? Uh, Luis Del Toro. Luis Del Toro. Mr. Yes, Del Toro, what is your concern? Uh, similar, uh, I was here for the past like two weeks. I was here from the very beginning that they began. I've been petitioning for two years. Uh, this is only the second time I've run into this issue. Um, and I was here from the very, very beginning of the initiative. Uh, I invested about like $1,000 into my hotel and gas since I got here. And I turned in about $4,500 worth of signatures. Um, I'm pretty good at producing. Uh, I do enjoy uh, collecting signatures. I think it's awesome. I used to work for like uh, direct TV and whatnot and direct sales. So I was, I was pretty good at it. So I did turn in a lot <laughs> and I got not a dollar from it. So I'm just trying to do how, my best. How many signatures are $4,500? I mean, I could calculate that right now. It was like $12 a signature. $12 a signature. Yeah. So this was a, and they're not normally this high, so this was a pretty special campaign in terms of like the money that was uh, involved with one signature. Usually they'll go anywhere from like two to five, mm -hmm. and then you'll get nice juicy ones like seven, you know, depending on what it is. And then this one came out for 12. Wow. But if I have 4,500 divided by 12, it's about 375 signatures. It's not that much. 375. But just because the pay, yeah, was, was high, it came out to... You know, 40, so that for me, a personal loss, that's about 5,500 loss if I include the hotel and, and, and the gas and getting and Were you led to believe that the county of Kern was uh, the one asking well, you to we do this? Well, we worked the initiative for Kern County, but the proponent is Gabriel Godinus, and he's represented by Ben Allenberg. Hmm. So uh, they're the ones uh, that pay, because the money trickles down, so I get my money from my coordinator, she gets it from the client, and the client will get it from whoever's, you know. At that, that's part where I kind of like lose track where it goes personally mm -hmm. because normally I don't really have to deal with something like this. I just deal with my coordinator, and that's it. Um, Any other names, uh, Mr. Your coordinator, or anybody Willie, else? Willie Rivera, I believe, was one of the names that showed up when I started investigating like the initiative online and started going on Facebook and started trying to see what's going on. Um, so I know the proponent was Gabriel Godinus, or I don't know how to pronounce it, Ben Eilenberg, and then, so yeah, so we're just trying, I'm personally, I'm just trying to make sure I at least get to see that, that money. <laughs> it was a lot, it was a lot of time out here in the, in the heat, you know what I mean? And it, it can get warm here. Two, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> two, two weeks, yeah, yeah. Let's, uh, Mr. Supervisor oh, Gleason, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. Luis, Luis, Luis yes, Del Toro sir. was his name. Did you know the other gentlemen were up here? Uh, the I knew Ryan. Okay, I, I fair know enough. Ryan. I know Ryan. Yeah, fair I, I, I just the want guy to... that spoke before me. I don't know, but I mean, I'm assuming he's just another petitioner like right. myself. There's lots I, of I got, it. I got it completely. Could you do me a favor, please? Could you leave your contact information sure. with our CAO? Absolutely. Just yeah. so we know, uh, we want to collect information on others and find yeah. what's going on. And would you yeah, like sure. Supervisor Gleason that information on Mr. Johnson, the first one who spoke as well, Ryan? Yeah, Johnson. he's up. Is he still Mr. here? Mr. Johnson, are you still here? 
Um, no, he went out, but I mean, I could text that's, him and see if it's okay. That's okay. Yeah. If you could just leave your stud name, that's good. With Mr. Yeah, because if you guys contact me, uh, me and Ryan booked the same hotels a lot in the Airbnbs and whatnot, so we kind of rolled together. Okay. How'd you know to come here? Uh, just in the industry, you network, you know what I mean? There's no, I mean, come to this building, to this meeting. Oh, because I just started asking questions. Who, who suggested <laughs> that you come here? Um, we, I mean, I'd rather just know. We're not giving you a hard time. Now. We just, yeah, yeah. we're curious. It's interesting. Uh, I mean, myself, basically, I just investigated. I asked a lot of people and then I found out like who the people were and I'm like, okay, well, my best bet is to come here, you know, mm -hmm. fig figured that that'd be a good mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. Why don't you give your contact information it's, to Mr. It's, Alsop? It's worth it for trying to retrieve four, four or five grand. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. But, uh, <clears throat> info and that's it. Yes, sir, that's it. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you. you. you uh, uh, Supervisor Couch has a I, I just want our staff to try to give them a explanation of the type of work they were doing, who they were working for, and the County of Kern's involvement or lack of it. And then a recommendation on if you were in their shoes, how would you proceed? Can you do that? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Well, this has been quite a public presentation moment. Yes, sir, go ahead. What is your name, sir? You have two minutes, by the way. Hi, my name is Jim Castellanos. I work with the Green Coast Cooperative. The last time we appeared at one of these meetings was back in November 2012-2013. This was after KCSO had illegally shut us down and seized six mother plants, legal cannabis plants, along with 21 ounces of our legal medicine, all with the use of a defective warrant back in 8 9 13. We had, we had been secretly removed from the County Board of Supervisors scheduled agenda to speak at the meeting of, on November 12, 2013, as we had forwarded an extensive and detailed evidence package to the Board of Supervisors and were going to expose this illegal activity. Charles Lackey from Code Compliance even testified before the supervisors that he told someone at his office to send us notice, but he also testified that he, if they, he did not know if the instructions were followed through to protocol. We were not allowed to speak. Since the burden was on code compliance to both send us notice and prove such notice was sent, it was presumed that we were denied both proper notice and due profit, uh, process. Therefore, everything the county has done has interfered with our business since the meeting was been illegal. We are now forwarding the supervisor a copy of the same evidence package giving a new notice, and the matter is far from over. Under the pretense of a defective an insufficient warrant under, pro, uh, under a provision of a code, namely Measure G, which was implemented without requisite env environmental case study needed to give it validity. Furthermore, no one has been able to provide any proof that that code had applied to Green Coast Co-op. These documents have teeth and traction. I have copies of exhibits right here, and I'll be sure that they'll find a way to the grand jury. <clears throat> And in closing, I would like to address certain members of the board. Mrs. Perez? Mr. Castellano, I'm not quite yes. sure what it is. Are you playing a tape for it? I was trying to give you information when Charles Lackey did not have the information. He did not have any, any copies of what he was supposed to be done to us. Mr. Castellano, your time yes. has expired. If you want to make a claim with the county, I would encourage you to contact Mr. Nation's office, the county council's office. I have a copy for him right here. Okay, very good. Thank you, sir. Who else would like to make comment to us this afternoon? Yeah, well, there's numerous hands, so why don't you guys make your way down to the front? Good afternoon. My name is David Abbasi with the Central Valley Cannabis Association. I'm here on behalf of Green Cross Collective as well. Um, I hear something about a vote going on this afternoon. I'm, I didn't see it in the agenda or anything, but supposedly you are going to vote to allow only seven dispensaries in the county of Kern. Um, uh, are, are you speaking to item number three? I, I don't know if, if it's item number three or not, but 
what I'm speaking in regards to also is the petitions that are circulating. Uh, Ganong's group, his circulators were on the streets actually collecting signatures alongside our petition, saying that our petition misrepresented, of course, that our petition was somehow going to eradicate all dispensaries and theirs was going to save them, getting them to sign the other petition. So that's misrepresentation on, on their part. On Eilenberg's group's part, um, they're saying circulators that are working on our petition must stop working our petition uh, if they want to work their petition and offering them more money to do so, which is against election law 18.620 and 621. Um, I also brought some uh, statements that were made earlier this year just to kind of remind you and bring things back into context. I also wanted to remind you on May 22nd, uh, Supervisor Perez herself said she was embarrassed and saddened that we as a body have not found a more productive way to work through this issue that does not involve the incredible, unreasonable, and despicable influence on this body by special interests. Her own confession and admission, Mr. Maggard, how much longer will you continue to say it's ridiculous and it's baseless when your own colleagues are calling you out, when their own confessions are saying we have allowed special interest groups to influence this body? So now, who are the seven you plan on having? Um, you can't even legislate. You can't legislate this according to the appeals court. Election code 9145, it told you what you can do. And you're not gonna use Phil Ganong's petition to get your seven by the way of the people. We're gonna make sure we overturn any of that stuff. I guarantee it. Can you give us your name for the record, please? Yeah, my name is uh, T.J. Esposito. I'm a local businessman, taxpayer, father, and a certified cannabis expert here in Kern County. Um, I just want to let you know that all these carnival workers that are uh, here talking about they didn't get paid, I just learned from this guy in the front row that they're with uh, Ganong's group. That it's part of your rollout, Maggard, to, to cover this up. We all know what it is. They're trying to debunk those signatures and we know we got, we got the guys, Mike Myers and Michelle, known Ganong signature gatherers. So I just want to make sure that the public knows that was a rollout. Those people were paid and organized to be here to say those things. He just, didn't you just say that, the, that they, oh, that's what I thought. So, so the guy with the gold Rolex uh, is saying no, but anyway, I just want to let you know that this morning, we, talk, we talked about how you took money on your 460 campaign contributions from a cannabis dispensary in December, before you even knew people were actually gonna look at that, okay? You took campaign contributions on your 460 at list, Kim Schaefer, Mr. Ganong's campaign manager, as your campaign manager, on your 460 campaign manager. We all know not everybody in the campaign is campaign manager, so she's got to be the campaign manager. I just want to know, I just want to let you guys know and reiterate, we do not want item three. We do not want your corrupted plan. So we you, don't you trust your corrupted plan. Number, Listen, gonna, it's my time. I got 24 no, seconds. No, sir. If you're speaking yeah, about no, I'm item... I'm saying, I'm saying we want... If you're speaking about item number three, you can speak about that when no, item No, what I'm three saying is up. we want to vote in November. Let the people vote. We turned in 40,000 signatures, two different initiatives turned in 20,000 signatures. Let it go to the people. We don't want your plan. I'll be back for item three. <laughs> Very good. Who's next? Um, <clears throat> Luis Santana, I'm the CEO of Green Coast Cooperative, a state registered medical mar marijuana association that's been in business since 2010. And the reason why we didn't make the second list is because we were forced out of business by two police officers. And this is an article that came out in Bakersfield, California. Two Kern County Sheriff's deputies have agreed to plead guilty in federal court for conspiracy to possess with intent to distribute marijuana as part of a criminal plot. These two officers, I have them on videotape when they came into our facility and we had six mothers and we had, our, uh, we had 21 ounces, which we were allowed to have. And they came in there and took everything, Lip, didn't leave inventory, didn't leave receipt. Two years later, now when you guys are being investigated, you come to say that there was 19 plants. You guys are lying. I'm willing to put my hand on the Bible. Are you, Magger? I know it's coming from you. You're, it's, it, trust me, it's not over. Keep on smiling. Mr. 
Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? How many others would like to speak? I think a gentleman over here had his hand up. And this fellow here, okay. I'm going to ask in a moment if the fellow in the black T-shirt that was alleged to have said something a moment ago, if he wants to defend himself. Yeah, but I'm we'll, we'll ask him in a moment. Yes, ma'am. Please give no us problem. your name. Uh, my name is Cecilia Latu. Um, good afternoon. Can you spell I'm your last name for us, ma'am? L-A-T-U. Thank you. And I'm with the Central Valley Cannabis Association. Um, I'm here to speak regarding the decision to allow only seven dispensaries in the county of Kern. So, ma'am, that, that, that item's up. Uh, that's item number three, which is going to take place in just a moment. This is about items that aren't otherwise on our agenda. Did you want me to wait? Yeah. Okay. Until that item comes up. No problem. So this, this, this is an opportunity for you to talk to us about matters that are not otherwise on our agenda today. Sir, would you like to defend yourself? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is your name, sir? Andre Vidamontes. Yeah, so I said, man, I don't know who he was, but he asked me who the people were collecting the signatures. All I said, I know a lady named Michelle was working with them. That's all I know. So you so, didn't you don't you didn't say what he just said you no, said. No, I had no idea. Okay. Very good. No. <laughs> Mr. Well, Esposito, if, if you don't on... follow protocol, Mr. Esposito, you'll be yeah. ushered from the room. Oh, there he is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know about this dude. It's wrong. Okay. With All right. Good <laughs> enough, sir. I thought you might want to defend yourself. Uh, somebody else came forward, I think. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Could you give us your name, please? Yes, my name is Dr. Ricardo Herrera. Um, I, my comments related to, um, semi-related to number three. One thing that I've noticed in the area, I've lived in, in the part of the south of the county for the last 30 years, is that a lot of these marijuana dispensaries have morphed since they've been closed. They morphed into a lot of these internet sweeps like casinos. And as a result of that, we've seen a, a tremendous rise in crime, prostitution, uh, more drugs beyond marijuana being dispensed at these areas. And as a board of trustee that I sit on, the Griefel Union School District, a lot of our schools are being impacted by this too. At our property that we own on, on South Union, we've seen prostitutions walk by, prostitutes, and the kids, we have a, actually a bus stop from the Bakersfield City School District on our property. And it's gone to the point that it's so bad that earlier this year in 2018, in February, actually, a man was shot outside one of these casinos and he actually died in front of a Union Market. And I don't know what it's, take for, what it's gonna take for the Board of Supervisors to act. Maybe you need four or five deaths before you guys act on this. I tried to speak to, speak to uh, Donnie Youngblood. He refused to speak. Lisa Green refused to speak to me. As a matter of fact, I went on Tuesday, May the 15th to the office of my representative, Leticia Perez. She scheduled an appointment for me to speak to her on July the 19th, two months later. And as a matter of fact, she's very absent today as well. What we demand from this area, from this community, is better leadership. Our, the school, Fairview Elementary, the school that I, re I represent, the 12 schools in the district, the principal actually told me that the, the park that sits adjacent to the school, actually there's a lot of now rising crime because of these casinos. As a matter of fact, a lot of people that are high on drugs are going to, to the park and throwing rocks to the students. And so much you have to request the teachers to remove the students from the fence because there's so many people, um, people high on drugs throwing rocks to the students. So it's a big issue. And I spoke to um, Craig Smith at the district, office, the district attorney's office. And he said, just kicked the can down the road. He actually said, well, this is, belongs to the California Gaming Board Commission. So, I mean, I don't know if it's Lisa Green, Donnie Young, but somebody has to step up and, and try to close these places down because they're causing a lot of crime in our area. I'd like to uh, just give you a little bit of assurance. Um, and, and was your last name Rivera? Herrera, H-E-R-R-E-R-A. -R -R -E. Sorry, I, I didn't understand. Mr. Herrera, um, we are working with the planning department, actually, about coming up with a strategy about how we might be able to control uh, when internet cafes pop up and whether or not it's a violation of zoning. It's an illegal activity, so that, therefore well, it's a violation of zoning. So I'm just suggesting to you, we, we are working on some strategies because that is a, it is a growing problem in many neighborhoods. So I join you in your concern about that. Well, my concern is when I spoke to the uh, uh, officer on Norris Road at the office, he basically crossed his arm. He said, because we have no funding, we can't do anything about mm -hmm. this. And I told him, you know what, if one of these places opens on um, Brimhall, Callaway, Coffee Road, I bet Donnie Yumbler will find the money to close these places down. Mm -hmm. But they're in the south part of the county, they're in the southeast. I know there's maybe a racial element to this because there's heavily Latino area. Maybe you don't care about it. But that's what it seems, that's what the sheriff's kind of mentality mm -hmm. came to me. I, I assure you that we care about it. So, uh, we, I, 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 let me, let me add, 
Rudy Salas, our, our representative in the California State Assembly, already passed legislation, and Jerry Brown signed it. And as a matter, that was in June 2015. The California State Supreme Court ruled in June of 2015 as well that these places were illegal. So I don't know if there's just lack of political will to go play, um, close these places mm -hmm. down. Somebody needs to um, get um, primary and voted out of our office. Mm. Well, I appreciate you bringing it to our attention. We, we, are, we are working on that, and uh, I, I urge you to talk, talk with the sheriff again, and I will refer to the sheriff your concern. Uh, Cynthia Zimmer, I spoke to her. She said she's ready to get this going on January 19th when she gets sworn in, so hopefully she can do a better job than Lisa Green. Thank you for coming forward. Who would be next? My name is Chad Garcia Mione. I'm gonna make it real quick. Doc, you want leadership? I'm a leader. Proven on the battlefields of Afghanistan three times. We do need leadership. And I ask that, I don't know what all this is about, but I'm a leader in the veteran community. And right now, this reason right here, all this bickering, whatever this is, whatever this is, this is why veterans aren't coming forward and claiming that they're using cannabis. 22 veterans a day are committing suicide. I buried three of my brothers. This is a real deal. This is a medication that they use. This isn't a joke. This isn't something to be taken lightly. And I'm not addressing just the Board of Supervisors. I'm, I'm addressing anybody listening. So to us, your local veterans who are afraid to come forward and say, hey, I use cannabis as opposed to using eight pills that make me feel horrible, this is why they're not coming forward. Because we see this on the news, the bickering, real patients that use this, that want to use this to better themselves. So this needs to be handled. My only suggestion is that we take it to a vote. Let the people decide. We the people. What that tattoo's for. It's what I had on my arm when I watched my friends die in Afghanistan so this could happen. I apologize if I seem a little angry. It's just that I represent a large amount of veterans in this community, some that you've met, who just want to use this to make their lives better like I am. Thank you very much. Who would be next? Is that it? Sir, you'll be next. Let's have this fellow, then we'll go to you. You, you, you're, you go ahead, sir. Next. Yes. What is your name, please? My name is Nicholas Cisneros. Um, well, I don't know if there's going to be translation to tag in Spanish. Oh, you, oh we, have a, we have a translator for you, sir. Okay. Gloria Zacharias. Are there any other members here this afternoon? You, you, you're, you had an interest about what was spoken about this morning about budget issues, I believe. Is that correct, sir? No. No? Yo vengo porque... Oh, about marijuana? Okay, ho 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 hold, hold on just a second. We'll get an uh, uh, interpreter for you. Ms. Zacharias? Senor? Como se llama? Nicolas Cisneros? Nicolas Cisneros. Cisneros, thank you. C-I-S-N-A-R-O-S. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, so could, could you assure him that you're going to interpret for him and uh, move on over so we can talk directly to you? Okay. Thank you. Señor, yo voy a por usted. Okay? Yo soy Gloria Zacarias. Please proceed, uh, sir. Vengo aquí porque soy, soy vecino del muchacho Ricardo que, que apenas estuvo aquí hablando y, y también porque soy el afectado ahí por las clínicas de, de la marihuana que están ahí en, en nuestra área. Hay cinco clínicas de marihuana en nuestra área y yo sé que algunas de ellas están funcionando ilegalmente porque hubo una ordenanza que pasaron. Un, que, un, un, un momento. Explain to him that we need to go back and forth. Okay, so he comes here this afternoon because he's also a neighbor to the gentleman who was here previously, Ricardo. Es su vecina, dijo. That that is one of his neighbors, and in his area where he lives, there are five different son casinos. Five dispensaries in his area that he knows are also. Um, close by his area where he lives. Okay, see it? Sí, este, y, y desde que están esas clínicas ahí, hay más, hay más delincuencia ahí, llegan prostitutas, como dijo mi compañero, llegan varias ahí, y, 
porque ahí está la, el, ahí están vendiendo la marihuana y ahí mismo se bajan ahí al pie de las clínicas de marihuana ahí hay uh, donde se bajan los niños de los autobuses escolares okay. In that same area where the dispensaries are located, he says there's also lots of prostitution. And there are also um, children around that area where it is highly visible, where there's a lot of traffic coming in and out of there. Que se bajan del autobús escolar. The ch and the children are also um, are being brought in by buses from their school, and they're being dropped off at that point in that area. Y huele muchísimo a marihuana ahí, desde ahora que están las clínicas ahí. El, el aire está contaminado de pura, pura marihuana y, y eso es muy malo para la salud de nuestros hijos. Y lo que están viendo ellos, están aprendiendo algo nuevo y, y es lo que están viendo ellos ahí, todo eso. Okay, in that specific area that he mentioned, he says you can smell the marijuana. The smoke, you can see it. Um, and it affects the kids that are being dropped off there because it's in open air. They're smelling it just as, just as much as the adults are. And he feels that it does or will affect these children that are constantly being dropped off by the school buses in that area. Thank you. W would you ask Mr. Cisneros a question for us? Where are, are these dispensaries located? Where is the neighborhood he's concerned about? ¿En qué área quedan estos cinco uh, lugares? Especialmente la que están allí al pie de mi casa, la que está en, en la Price y la, la que está en la, allí en South Union. La, la calle Price la y South Union? Y South Union. Price and South Union. Price and South Union Streets. Thank you. ¿Qué más, señor? Y de hecho, un día se agarraron a balazos allí en la clínica y fue a caer uno en la Union Market allí muerto. Okay, there happened to be a shootout in one of the dispensaries and one of the persons that was shot ended up at the Union store. ¿Ahí enfrente de la tienda? Sí, a la right tienda. In, a la right tienda, in tienda, front of the store. Cayó. He dropped because mm -hmm. um, he was shot. Yo ahí vivo al pie. So it's, it gets violent there as well in that area. So his concern, of course, are the children that they're yes. being dropped off by the school buses in that area, very close to the vicinity of the five dispensaries. Would you please share with him that we are very concerned about his concerns and that we will convey his concerns to the Sheriff's Department today? Okay, dice él que van a, a notificar el departamento de Sheriff's y ellos también tienen, uh, este están preocupados también por la misma problema. Pero, pero van a avisar también al sheriff hoy mismo. Pero yo quisiera saber que me den algo de, de qué están haciendo para cerrar esto, si está funcionando ilegalmente, que qué están haciendo, que, que me digan qué hicieron o qué van a hacer. Okay, so he would like some kind of reassurance as to what is going to be done besides letting the sheriff know. I mean, are they going to continue to stay open or are you going to try to get him closed? He just wants some kind of reassurance. The, the criminal acts are criminal and the sheriff's department is who enforces the law. So that, that part of it's up to them. And then okay. I'll ask a question of Ms. Oviat. Okay. Oh, you take any time so las actas criminales son actas criminales. Por eso van a avisar el sheriff's department para que vayan allí y se uh, entierran en los problemas que van allí. So por pero, eso les van a dejar a saber. Pero yo quiero, quiero saber qué van a hacer ellos. Si están violando la ley ya de que no deben no deberían de abrir clínicas después del 2016 y unas clínicas las abrieron después del 2016 por la ordenanza que pasaron. No las deberían dejar. ¿Por qué las están dejando? Okay, he mentioned that there was an ordinance after 2016 that they were going to be closed. Mm -hmm. So he's asking why aren't they closed? So let me get an answer for that. Ms. Oviat, and can you interpret for him? We'll pause so that you can interpret for Mr. Cisneros. Okay. Ms. Oviat, do we know if there are any grandfather dispensaries near Price and South Union? Supervisor Maggart, there are two dispensaries on South Union uh, that are legal nonconforming. The three others are on the list for uh, enforcement and closure, and we are taking actions to do that. But there are two on the list on South Union that are going through the process, and uh, we will not be making them close until uh, they complete their process, and then they would close on November 24th, 2018. So could you explain that to him, and then I'll give you some instructions. Okay, so this is the area where you live. Yeah, I understand. Okay, he said he understood. Quiero decir algo más. Okay. Este, so, quisiera so, que, que hagan algo, quisiera que hagan algo, porque está afectando la salud de los niños, porque está el, el olor de la marihuana y todo, y luego la prostitución, aparte de eso. Ahí estamos, tenemos contaminado el aire. 
Entonces necesito que hagan algo para parar eso, que no esté haciendo eso ahí. Que quiten completamente las clínicas de allí. Okay. ¿Por qué? No deben de estar en una área residencial afectando a la familia. Okay, so he's just reiterating that he wants something done to remove those dispensaries, but also they should not be in a residential area. They are affecting these children. He wants um, assurance that they're going to be removed from the residential area, and he he's wanting reassurance that that's going to be done. Ms. Obia, could you explain our the current status of our ordinance and um, if you know it, the enforcement of it? If you know it. Chairman Maggard, two of those dispensaries, uh, they, that industrial area backs up to a residential area, so I appreciate that his perception is that that's a residential area, but that is a industrially and commercial designated area, so two of them comply. I would uh, be cautious. We do have a task force, and the DA, the sheriff, and others are involved in it, and all I can say right now is that we are taking actions to... Uh, including in court against these other dispensaries. Uh, it is a long legal process, and I defer to county council. Mr. Nations, would you like to say anything about this? <clears throat> Certainly. We are in the process of having the sheriff uh, take enforcement action over these on the criminal level against the dispensaries that are operating illegally in the county. And um, we're meeting on Friday with the sheriff's department to kick that effort off, and we are hoping it will be swift. Okay, I'm gonna first interpret what she said. Okay, so los do, dos lugares de los cinco que están en la área de donde usted mencionó, dos están en un área industrial, no es, reside, no es de, de residencia, Re, ¿cómo se dice? Residencia. residencia. Okay, los otros tres, Están tratando y están en el proceso de cerrarlos, pero eso también toma tiempo. El proceso para cerrarlos sí toma tiempo. Ahora, aparte, dice el señor Nations que también andan a, a trabajando con el departamento de sheriffs y van a tener corte también para cerrar esos tres que están abiertos en ese lugar. El proceso también es largo, pero están tratando de hacerlo. Pues me gustaría que lo hicieran porque... Uh, no me gustaría que siga afectando a las familias que estamos ahí, porque aunque está en un área residencial, como dice la uh, muchacha, ¿qué? Este, está muy pegado a la, a la zona residencial. Uh -huh. De todos modos, aunque sea área industrial allí, alcanzan los efectos completamente ahí a la, a la familia. Otra vez, ella so, reconoce so we, eso. We, we give two minutes to raise concerns to the board. We've been very, very generous with that two minutes with this fellow because okay. of his, his language okay. issues. Please, please give us the specific addresses to Ms. Oviat. Uh, you can give those to the interpreter and she can get, pass them on to Ms. Oviat. And, uh, and we'll, we'll try to help you with your concern. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, the fellow back here, had, no, this fellow here, I think we said was next. Ms. Zacharias, we'll call on you again in a moment if somebody else needs an interpreter. Is that all right? Thank you for helping us this afternoon. Good, Good afternoon. afternoon. Could you give us your name, sir? Uh, Eric Giro. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, honorable chairman and members of the board. Uh, I do have something to say about an agenda item, which I will defer until item three is discussed. Um, in terms of items that are not on the agenda, I would just like to reiterate uh, my request that the board uh, join the federal amicus brief against the sanctuary state laws in California. Um, as my understanding, there might have been some miscommunication or some kind of a uh, misunderstanding. Um, any party is legally allowed to join as a friend of the court, an amicus brief. So um, I don't think there is anything that could preclude the county from joining that if it so chose after a full uh, debate, of course. Um, there's a much larger debate about illegal aliens and illegal immigration in this country, but this uh, SB 54 amicus brief is very narrowly defined. It's simply about uh, transferring very dangerous individuals from local custody into federal custody in a controlled environment. That's all it's about. So I think we should support that 100%. We should support law enforcement 100%. Uh, their job is difficult enough without uh, making it even more difficult than necessarily. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Giroux, for sharing your concern. Sir, I believe you had a, a, a concern as well. I'll wait for item three. Oh, item three, thank you. Are there any other members of the public that would like to speak about items that are not otherwise on our agenda? Okay, I'm gonna close this portion of the meeting.
and uh, return to the board. Members, do you have any reports or comments you'd like to make before we proceed with the afternoon's agenda? Thank you, then. Uh, item number th uh, three on our agenda is a recommendation from the Health and Social Services Subcommittee on Limited Medicinal Cannabis Retail Operations in Kern County. Ms. Oviat, would you uh, set this discussion up for us, please? Certainly. Good afternoon, Chairman Maggard, members of the board. On December 5th, 2017, your board made a referral to the Health and Social Services Subcommittee to discuss and make a recommendation on amending the zoning ordinance to allow for a limited number of medicinal cannabis retail operations. Concerns were expressed by your board that the adopted ban on all commercial cannabis operations in the unincorporated areas, along with the requirement that legal nonconforming medicinal operations must cease operation November 24, 2018, would leave people who use medicinal cannabis without access. The Health and Social Services Subcommittee is comprised of Chairman Maggard and Supervisor Gleason. The CAO provides staffing, and we appreciated the support of their staff for the Health and Social Services Subcommittee meetings. Kern County Planning and Natural Resources Department, along with County Council, provided staffing for this specific issue. First, to review the current state of cannabis regulation in unincorporated county. All commercial cannabis activities, both medicinal and recreational, were prohibited under the zoning ordinance and certified environmental impact report that your board adopted, and that became effective November 24, 2017. However, in that ordinance, based on a court order, section 19.0855 allowed for the operation of legally nonconforming medicinal cannabis retail locations for one year. 31 of them have been certified as legal nonconforming. They can operate until November 24, 2018. If they're in full compliance with building permits and inspections and then obtain a state permit. So as a reminder, that court order, that court decision said that the 2009 ordinance was still in effect. Therefore, they had to be in a zone that was designated for pharmacies, so a commercial or industrial zone. And they had to be 1,000 feet from a school and 1,000 feet from a youth center. Uh, the ordinance is very simple and only requires that they get a building permit review for change of occupancy or any changes they've made so that we can make sure it's safe. To date, of the 31, 15 have submitted for building permits. Three have submitted, been issued permits, and are waiting for inspection. Two are in Bakersfield, and one is outside Ridgecrest. Thirteen have not submitted, but most of them have self-identified that they are working on it. Once they get their inspection, then my department will provide a letter to the Bureau of Cannabis Control saying that they have a local land use approval, and they would then go to the state and get a M-type medicinal cannabis retail operation license. The ordinance provides that on November 24, 2018, all must close, even if they have a license, if they believe they've not recouped their investment during the 2018 year of operation, they may apply for an extension. That is laid out, and the process is laid out in the ordinance. As a reminder, personal use in private of both recreational and medicinal cannabis is now legal. Growing of six plants if you're over 21, medicinal 18 to 21 if you have a card. Growing of six plants for personal use is legal. And gifting up to one ounce of cannabis to a person over 21 is legal. The subcommittee met on May 30th, 2018 and June 11th. Chairman Maggard and Supervisor Gleason were in attendance and conducted the meeting. It was well attended and the public provided both written and verbal comments. Written comments and all of the materials that were provided to the subcommittee has been provided in the staff report that was online and has been provided to your board. The comments are summarized on page two of the staff report. For purposes of the public, if your board would indulge me, uh, I believe there are people who want to make comments today. I would like to read these bullet pointed comments so that they understand that these comments have been provided to you. First, patients need to have access to medicinal cannabis. Driving long distances to visit a retail store is a burden and may present a barrier to obtaining the product. Delivery of medicinal cannabis was not universally acceptable. Many expressed concern on quality, legality of the product, and fears of people knowing where they live. Others supported delivery as an alternative to open storefronts that will expose children in the community to the industry. 
The legal non-conforming medicinal cannabis operations believe they should be given priority in any new permitting. Others extend this priority status to anyone who is open and operating in 2018 or at some date the industry selects. The introduction of large corporations into the business and the county medicinal business should be discouraged. Remember, these are com a variety of comments from the public. Limiting the number countywide will dis disadvantage patients and create a monopoly. The number of retail operations should be linked to the number of patients, and 10 is too few. They believe that any ordinance should be written by members of the industry, and a cannabis advisory committee should be formed to work on an ordinance and enforcement. The illegal growing and sale is threatening the medicinal cannabis industry, and appropriate regulations would help stop that. The board should support the recent federal legislation to take cannabis off the federal Schedule I drug list. Microenterprise licenses from the state that would allow a location to have medicinal retail sales grow up to 10,000 square feet indoor only and manufacture limited products all at the same location should be allowed. Cannabis is still illegal under federal law and the voters of Kern County voted against Proposition 64. It should remain banned. And the setback should be the state requirements of 600 feet from parks, schools, and youth centers, and both commercial and industrial zones should be permitted. This is a summary of the uh, uh, comments that were made at both of the, um, both of the subcommittee meetings. The discussion on, if we could have the overhead, the discussion on allowing a change to the zoning ordinance centered on the following parameters from the subcommittee themselves. Medicinal retail only, it could have delivery or without delivery. As a reminder, the new rules that the state of California has adopted, all delivery must have a storefront to obtain a state license, although it does not have to be open to the public. There is no such thing as, an, as delivery that does not have a storefront in an appropriate zone signed off by the local um, jurisdiction. Uh, there, was no, there was to be no growing, no licensed testing facilities, and no microenterprise licenses. And there was a discussion that there should be a limited number of medicinal facilities countywide. A range was discussed from uh, 4 to 10. The conversation also centered around how many medicinal patients are there in Kern County. I want to distinguish for a moment, this is a different question than how many medicinal patients might be coming into the county from other areas to buy uh, medicinal cannabis. But let's just first talk about Kern County. Uh, we provided a handout, which you have, that provided, that allows what all 58 counties are doing. Only 14 counties allow retail medicinal, and three more only allow delivery. There was a range and limit of counties in their total population. An example is San Bernardino County, which is significantly larger than us. They have 2.3 million people, and they only have 17 uh, outlets, retail outlets. Others, such as Salinas, that has 515,000 people, only allows seven. Now, that's total population. So the questions of how many customers, uh, we went back and I looked at the analysis that was done for the environmental impact report. Uh, that, of course, was the number of adults who would use both recreational and medicinal. So I looked at the Department of Finance results, which is taxation. I discussed when people in Sacramento have been tracking this issue. I discussed with the various universities, such as UC Davis. At this point, based on Colorado statistics, remember that in Colorado, medicinal and adult use have been legal since 2014. So we are talking four years. There, 1.65% of the adults 21 and older use medicinal cannabis, 1.65%. The representation in the literature is that people who were using medicinal may then have moved to recreational and leaving the legitimate patients. Recent numbers in California show 3.15% of the population is a patient. Therefore, I use the larger number, 3.15%. Just to walk our way through the numbers, there are over 21 411,353 people in the population of Kern County, about half in the cities and half in the unincorporated communities. I did not try to break this out. I just used the whole thing. Using a higher California number, that means there would be 12,958 patients, about 13,000 people. 
Staff did review the California Department of Public Health Medical Marijuana Identification Card Program. As a reminder, you are exempt from paying the tax if you are registered in this program, yet there are only 1,200 cards who are registered in that program. Los Angeles County has over 10,000 cards registered, and San Bernardino has about 3,500 cards. Uh, it is voluntary so that you don't have to pay the tax, but we use that as, I use that as a gauge. The 50,000 number that people represented was actually taken from my environmental impact report staff report, and that was 50,000 was based on the number, the percentage of people in the adult population who would use recreational and medicinal, not just medicinal, and this discussion is limited on medicinal. I then backed it out and looked at the number of retail operations we have. We have 67 retail operations, 31 that are legal nonconforming, and then uh, approximately 35 that we're aware of that are operating. If each one of them had 2,000 customers, that would be over 30% of the adult population in Kern County is using medicinal cannabis. That would be higher than anything in San Francisco or Los Angeles. And I assert that based on my information and discussions with universities that that would probably not be logical. Therefore, using 12,958 customers, even as low as seven operations would be sufficient depending on where they're located. We looked at restrictive setbacks. The setbacks are the same as were discussed in the EIR, 1,500 feet minimum from schools, public parks, large family daycares, youth centers, libraries, churches, places of worship, city limits, and 350 feet setback from existing residential houses. There was much discussion about commercial and industrial, and the uh, consensus was that commercial was more difficult because of the things you heard even today about children walking in those areas. So the proposal would be industrial only. And there was interest in a limited approval for a conditional use permit. These would all be by conditional use permit, where in this case, the conditional use permit would only be good for three years, for example. And then depending on, they would have to go back before the planning commission and their history of following the rules and be in full compliance could then get them another three years for conditional use permit. So what you have before you is two options. An option one, which is no change, uh, and that is based on a variety of factors, including uh, that right now we do have access for medicinal. We have these initiatives. Uh, the city of Bakersfield has announced that their initiative, of course, will be on November, and then we have uh, unclarity about the timing of the three potential initiatives being placed on the ballot. Therefore, perhaps at this point, there should be no change to the ban until we get our enforcement arm uh, such that we can shut down all of the illegal ones that are causing issues. And then the second option is uh, to refer to planning and natural resources to create an ordinance that would have seven operations. If you look at this, we've divided the county into Valley Mountain and Eastern Kern, and this uh, concept would be, by conditional use permit, there'd be four in the Valley Mountain area, three in Metro Bakersfield and one outside. It could be in Fraser Park, it could be near Taft, and then three in Eastern Kern, one in District 1, one in District 2, and one anywhere. That is what the subcommittee's recommendation was. Since that time, there have been significant changes in uh, some cities, as well as this Bakersfield initiative that I'd like to bring to your attention. I've provided you with an addendum that reviews the new information we have on California City and Arvin. So since that time, find it. On May 30th, the Arvin Planning Commission, based on a referral from the City Council, recommended approval of amendments to their existing commercial cannabis ordinance. They are now going to allow both adult use and medicinal retail delivery-only operations. The number of micro-business Type 12 state licenses, which could include delivery and retail, would be limited to 10. The City Council will be considering this recommendation to approve in a July hearing. Therefore, Arvin, which you can see on the map, is somewhat centrally located, could provide delivery to the Valley Mountain area. 
In addition, on June 12th, the California City Council approved uh, to begin the process of amendments to their existing commercial cannabis ordinance. They are going to allow adult use and they're going to allow two storefronts open to the public and two storefronts closed to public delivery only. Uh, they have indicated to me that they, um, they uh, will have this done in the August-September time frame. Medicinal cannabis users in the unincorporated areas would have access from City of Arvin and then they would also have access from California City. I would like to note for the purposes of this discussion, you have heard a lot of testimony about Bakersfield-centric cannabis. I'd like to point out on this map the Antelope Valley, which is Los Angeles County, Lancaster, Palmdale. It's 11 miles one way to Rosamond, where we have an, a cluster of both legal and not legal cannabis operations. Uh, it has been reported by Uber and Lyft drivers. They've confirmed significant increased trips from these areas to the Rosamond Cannabis Operations. In fact, most of their work daily is up to 20 trips a day from Lancaster Palmdale to these dispensaries. The location of legal cannabis sales uh, deliveries in California City would provide a more limited service area due to distance and therefore, if your board is interested in providing for medicinal access to Kern County patients, the California City option would, be, uh, would uh, possibly cut into this uh, destination situation that we have, that we are actually not providing access in Eastern Kern for patients of Kern County. We are providing them for Los Angeles County, Lancaster, and Palmdale. I have looked at the routes. Uh, it's about 45 minutes from California City to Ridgecrest. It's an hour and 20 minutes maybe to the Kern River Valley, but if a delivery service was created, I'm sure from Ridgecrest to Kern River Valley, that would be cut back. So uh, in this case, I do believe that these two change circumstances should be taken into account in your deliberations. And lastly, I would note that when we look at land use, we, there are many things that your board has decided you, that we should be limited. You recently passed an ordinance on massage parlors and we've had a uh, crackdown on those and we've looked very carefully at where they should be allowed. Your board has actually said no to type 21 liquor licenses for uh, alcohol and looking at over concentrations. You, are care you have said no to the city of Los Angeles' spreading of biosolids. You have looked carefully in the unincorporated areas of what you want to provide for unincorporated residents. As a reminder, the 12,000 number includes people in the cities, and your board, uh, I'm sure, uh, would take into consideration that we are not necessarily required to provide access for our land use for cities that have banned it as well. That completes my presentation. I'm available for questions. I know there's a lot of information there, so I will um, ask that you let me know what else you'd like to know. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Oviat. Are there any members of the board that would have any questions for Ms. Oviat or staff before we, or want to make a comment before we go to the public? How many people would like to speak this afternoon regarding this item? Okay, I'm going to set a time frame of 20 minutes uh, to see if that can capture everyone. So I would urge you to, uh, I'm not going to set an individual time limit, but 20 minutes for the topic. Uh, so please uh, be considerate of those who would like to speak as well. So who would like to come forward and be first? Please give us your name. Good morning or afternoon. David Abbasi, Central Valley Cannabis, uh, regarding her numbers, 12,000. Uh, Green Cross Collective has 12,000, over 12,000 patients alone. I don't think those numbers are uh, a good barometer or gauge to go by. Um, this has already been adjudicated. This has already been ruled on. Uh, you cannot ban medical marijuana. Uh, you guys have already tried to regulate in this arena. Uh, and um, you don't have the legal authority to ban, according to Election Law 9145 and the Fifth District Appellate Court of Appeals. Uh, it left you with the only option to uh, have a voter-approved ordinance to change 
or repeal the uh, 2009 ordinance. Um, regarding, uh, we'll, ret we'll overturn the ban and any measure subsequently. So, should Ganong's petition pass, which allows you to do only seven dispensaries, as you wish, that will be overturned. Should Eilenberg's petition pass, which only allows select areas where his properties are located, right, right there, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, don't, <laughs> I don't think these are gonna pass, but they'll be overturned. Our petition will remain, and you guys will have nothing but the 2009 ordinance again and a proliferation on your hands, which we don't want. Uh, you, you took money from a dispensary, Mr. Maggard. It's on your 460 form. Kim took money, Kim Schaefer took money from cannabis groups on your behalf, from Phil Ganong's group. Uh, our ordinance prevents public corruption. It keeps cannabis businesses away from schools and out of neighborhoods. It allows law enforcement to take swift action. It protects safe access for veterans and qualified patients. It allows for reasonable taxes to ensure the success of the program and to prevent the black market from reviving. I think you guys should take our ordinance into serious consideration as it is also a fair and inclusive one um, that allows those who were here earnestly, legitimately operating only with proofs, sp specific proofs, to obtain any state licensing. So for you to just limit it to two or seven or 10, uh, I'm not sure how you plan on doing that, but it should be uh, taken into account. Um, first, you legally can't do that. But secondly, even if you were to think about, you know, who was established, uh, go by the dates, go by the proofs. I've seen other people with less proof be qualified or deemed legal. How, how do you know which ones are illegal, Mr. Nations, and which ones are not? Simply by, by choice, and which is why we don't need CUPs or conditional use permits for this. We do not need CUPs. The state will take care of it. The state will take care of who is a good player, who's a bad player, who can be permitted or licensed, and who can't. It totally takes the, the stress out of your hands and also the potential for any public corruption. So again, given these uh, issues that we've had in the past. We've carefully uh, crafted an ordinance that was done by a professional law firm that specializes in these matters, not a personal injury attorney who, who committed massive fraud apparently, allegedly, or you know uh, another disbarred attorney who uh, bought a bunch of property here and, and was pushing it through Perez. Come on guys, let's do this legitimately, ethically, honestly, do this fairly, and think about the people that are suffering, their, their access, their needs, and for the folks that have put in uh, a lot of time and invested a lot of money into their businesses to be able to operate, such as Green Cross Collective and others, such as Louis Santana over here. I think that guy got, uh, you know, the short end of the stick on that one. So yeah, we, we see these examples. It's not ridiculous, it's not baseless, it's reality, and we know the realities now. And we hope that you would look at this uh, with that in mind. Thank you very much. P please come forward, yes. Please give us your name and proceed, sir. Eric Giroux. Um, I'll keep it brief because I know there are quite a few people who would like to speak. Uh, I think seven is a good number. Uh, it protects access to veterans, as this gentleman said. I'm a veteran myself, and I totally respect that. Um, but if you have two or three in Bakersfield, one in Ridgecrest, one in Taft, one or two up in Delano, that's about enough. People come into town every week to go to Costco and Walmart to do their shopping, and they can do that for uh, medicinal marijuana as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Giroux. Who would be next? There's 15 minutes remaining, by the way. Thank you, Ralph Robles. I would remind you to Mr. Herrera's statement about the violence and the crime, the prostitution going on in uh, his area down by uh, South Union. I used to live around the corner from there, and I still remember the time that I got uh, attacked by a gang because they thought that I should not uh, witness uh, their doing business on the side of, of uh, uh, South High. Folks, this drug 
misuse is a very, very dangerous drug. It is the gateway to the other drugs. More than that, it is a gateway to uh, increased corruption, increased crime, increased danger to our children. I urge you to use caution. You, uh, of course, are complying with the law. And you have to provide what the law demands. But I urge you very strongly, do it cautiously, do it wisely. Thank you. Who would be next? I'll make it quick. Uh, uh, my third time today, I just want to reiterate what I said. TJ Esposito, local taxpayer and businessman. Um, I just want to reiterate uh, to the board um, and everybody else that there are two initiatives. Uh, there's a city initiative. Um, we've all seen the paperwork where there's clear Measure K conflicts with Mr. Maggard, uh, me Measure K violations. We do not want Mr. Maggard's plan. The taxpayers want to vote. 40,000 people want to vote on this. Let them vote on it. We don't need his plan. We don't need his ties, his golden handshakes. It's costing all of us millions. You got a lot of people, the, Phil Ganong, everybody else who has competing interests probably could all agree, we don't want Maggard's plan. Yep. Okay, we want to vote in November. And I would highly encourage Mr. Maggard to recuse himself from any further cannabis votes, knowing that his campaign manager represents a large cannabis group and he's also taken money from a known cannabis dispensary owner. That's all I have. Who'd be next? Okay, first of all, I wanna go back in 2010 when we Mr. opened Santana, up- Mr. Santana, you need to give us your name for the um, record. Lu Louis Santana, um, CEO of Green Coast Cooperative. First of all, I wanna go back to 2010 when we opened up our business. We went to the code compliance um, office and I actually spoke to that lady right there. And she's the one that told me M1, M2 in an unincorporated area, 1,000 weight thousand feet away from the school in which we're operating for about a year and a half and then we get a letter on our door saying that we have 24 hours to abate our business you gave everybody else 30 days you gave me 24 hours that was illegal you broke your own protocol we followed the t we asked you to prove up your claim that that there are shots fires there's a nuisance there's robberies you failed you failed by your own policy and then, and then you send me a letter saying, oh, we're, you know what? We agree we didn't give you enough time. We're going to come back with another ordinance. So very vindictive. What you, and so I'm going to skip to that. So one day I go outside and I see this gentleman taking picture of my business. And I go outside and I'm like, what, what are you doing? And he goes, oh, the, um, he goes, you can't have these pots out here. And there were aloe vera and succulent plants. So I was like, what? I was like, let me remove them. And then, and then the gentleman tells me, no. He goes, no, I'm going to have to give you a, cita a citation for this. So I didn't show the picture of the Green Coast off top. I took a picture just of my plants that beautify in my business in Oildale. And I go down to code compliance. And code compliance, go, I spoke to, you know, excuse my language, but it was in 2011. It was a, a black gentleman that was uh, in charge of the department. And he actually told me this is coming from Mac Magger's office. OK? And so one more thing is that I've actually went to uh, the Kern County Farm Bureau, and a lot of people don't know the monopoly that's going on with the farming. So these people, they think that they could operate their business, but they're going to be getting in front of a distribution center. And then I told, I told Laura Avia, secretary, that, hey, I'm allowed to facilitate, cultivate, transport in the state of California. We're a registered cooperative. No one has a cooperative in Kern County. That's why you're suing us for $12,000 a day, isn't it, huh? And, the, and my competitor, you're only suing him for $1,000? dollars a day? Yeah. The, oh, it's going to be great. Who would be next? There's nine minutes, 54 seconds left. So let's try to, to uh, move quickly so everybody gets a chance. Good afternoon. Could you give us your name, please? Yes. Good afternoon again. My name is Cecilia Latu, LATU. I'm with the Central Valley Cannabis Association. I'll make it short. I just have these notes that I wanted to submit here again. Um, just here speaking regarding the decision to only allow seven dispensaries in Kern County, just asking how... Um, how does one decide to get, or how do you decide who gets to be on those seven dispensaries? As a result of your decision to limit the amount of dispensaries, 
you'd be going against your own environmental impact report, which stated the best option was dispensaries only. Reducing the number would have a negative effect on the environment besides it being a monopoly. This will also have an adverse effect on patients who struggle to get their medication, surely drive up the prices and will drive them back to the black market and streets, and that is something that we are trying to prevent. Our proposed ordinance is circulating for signatures right now, and unlike the other two monopoly petitions, it is a fair and inclusive process. Only those businesses that can show they were legitimately operating with certain proofs can have a chance at obtaining a state license. This would ensure safe access and reasonable access as well as establishing limits. Please consider earnestly working with stakeholders and the experts so that we, that we may find a solution that works. Uh, one that doesn't involve litigation or political fighting. Um, and that's really all I have to say. And um, thank you for your time. And, you know, we have God in God we trust up here, and that's what we believe in. And it's the right for the people to vote and to decide what they want going forward with this issue. There's a lot of fighting going back and forth, and I'm just here to represent the California Cannabis Association because that is a movement that I believe in, and I believe that we need to unify. Thank you. Thank you. I see three speakers, and there are eight minutes left, so I urge you to come to the microphone and uh, proceed as quick as possible, please. Hi, my name is Robert Scott Stearns. I'm the sole owner of American Organics Club in beautiful downtown Rosemont. AOC began as a small collective of like-minded patient grouping together to find safe, affordable cannabis to alleviate variety of pain symptoms from various illnesses. Our objective has always been to provide this service in accordance with state law while providing our patients members with compassionate fellowship and helpful information and resources available for healing and being well. We ask the board of members <clears throat> we ask the board members to consider the health and welfare of our fellow citizens and to allow our collective to continue providing these services in a safe, legal environment. Uh, Ms. Owat, uh, uh, the numbers are way, 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 way out of whack. I have over 13,000 patients myself, and I can imagine how many patients these have. We have liquor stores on every corner. We have cigarettes. We have opiates taking over every American. I can't remember how many times I've had a patient or a vet come into my shop and say, oh my God, thank you very much, Scott, and they hug me. I'm off of my opiates. You, 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 you gave me the right type of medicine. My patients, 60% of them are over 60 years old. I give veteran discounts. Anybody in a wheelchair is free. Anybody with terminal cancer is free. I'm a very compassionate person. We should not be arguing. It got voted by the state of California to be legal in the state of California. It should be legal everywhere, everywhere. Nobody should bicker. Nobody should say we need 10, we need 15, we need three, and we need two, we need eight. We need the amount of collectives to warrant how many people are smoking or are using the CBD oil. The CBD oil doesn't cure cancer, it prevents it. It puts a tiny ring around cancer cells, mostly in women, in the breasts and the ovaries. It prevents cancer. I got my mom through cancer at 79 years old. She was taking opiates, she couldn't eat, she couldn't breathe, she was crawling on the floor. She couldn't come here today, but I gave her some of my cannabis in, in the way I know how to uh, do it, and lo and behold, she got her appetite back. She's in remission. She hasn't had any problems in six years. She has no blood clots. She has nothing. Cannabis is here. It's always been here, and it is here to stay. If you guys start making three, four, seven, eight, the black market's going to come up and wipe everything out, okay? Mr. Hearn, now there's less than four minutes left and there are four speakers that still want to speak. So would you yield the mic to let somebody else speak? Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, sir. Okay, let's try to be quick about it. I want to make sure everybody Thank gets a chance. Uh, my name is Anthony Espindola. Um, I'm here from Community of Boron. I'm on the Boron Chamber of Commerce there. I own a restaurant in Boron. I also own a few dispensaries with my family. We're all 
family run and operated. I'm here to discuss these numbers. These numbers are really low. We work with, alongside with a doctor from the Ridgecrest Regional Medical Center, and he's, his, when he started interviewing his patients, he was getting up to 20, 25% of his patients saying that they were using medical marijuana to help them with their conditions. This is in Ridgecrest. In Ridgecrest alone, right outside, we have over 10,000 patients. Of course, we serve the people in Ridgecrest and the people outside of Ridgecrest and the surrounding community. Same thing's happening in Rosemont. We have over 10,000 patients. We're serving the people from the Eastern Kern and from LA County. Why would we just give away that money back to LA County or back to another county? You know, we'll take their money too. And we'll put it into our Kern County bank account. Our Kern County sheriffs could use it. So I think they've been limiting the number and, re and analyzing how many patients we actually have. Another deal, 3.15%. Uh, uh, our population, according to the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau, uh, was 893,119. That means 3.15% is 28,000, a little over 28,000 uh, people. And you divide that by seven, that's 4,000 people per per shop. 4,000, that means it, those people would only have to come to the shop once. And you would have to, every shop would have to be open 14 hours a day just to serve one patient once. And they can only come once a month. I don't think that those numbers are really good. I think that we should research some more numbers. Thank you, guys. Thank you. There's two minutes and 49 seconds. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Powers. I am with dr9306.com, and I work in the track and trace department. I've been here to, through several meetings, and uh, my concern at this point is that the list that I have in front of me to install the track and trace system is different. I have 28 on my list, and I fully understand at this point exactly how it works. I have to wait on your list before I can install track and trace on anybody's list. So kind of to give you a background on what the track and trace can do for all of us at this point to address many of the concerns, the track and trace allows us to make sure that we can report that these dispensaries that are open have been certified by the state. Me as a track and trace person, we have to validate everybody we sign up. We have to turn our report into the state. We're not obligated to turn it into you guys, but we are obligated to turn it on. So as soon as we receive a list from you guys, we can definitely report back and tell you these guys are state compliant from a track and trace standpoint, which is a little more than half of their compliance. Once they've gone through all of the code, they have to sign up for track and trace. They receive a key from the track and trace. We're here to help them manage it. We're here local now. We've brought in our staff to support the 28 that are on our list. I now understand there's 31 non-conforming. We can track and trace all 31. We don't have the limited resources. We're tracking seed to consumption. This is what's required by the state. We're here to support these guys. And if they don't qualify for the state, obviously it's a moot point. So we're just here to let you know that we're here to stay and support your decision at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's 58 seconds left, so I'm going to allow these two speakers as the last two speakers to speak. So, Madam Clerk, would you now reset the clock for two minutes each so that each of these gentlemen gets two minutes, and then that will be the last of our speakers about this matter. Can you please give us your name for the record, please? All right. How are you guys doing? Uh, my name is Christopher Clark. I work for Tanner Vest Collective. Uh, I just wanted to point out that um, I, I understand you guys' reason for trying to reduce the number of dispensaries, although I think seven is a little too low for the amount of people there are. I just like to also add that if you do allow them, they should be micro businesses. They should allow to uh, cultivate, manufacture, um, deliver if they need to. I don't think they should be sold delivery because, uh, you know, the stigma that we're going to go to somebody's house and, you know, try and rob them is just crazy. What's been happening is we get called to an address and uh, it's not the right address and we get robbed. That's happened to, you know, a lot of the businesses that have deliveries. So safe access to this medicine is what's important. Also, um, by just having retail, you're saying that we need to get our medicine from somewhere outside the county. You know, you argued that we're serving people from outside the county, but if we're not allowed to grow it ourselves, then we have to get it from outside the county anyways. So I think that micro businesses are um, what is needed. You know, it allows us to, to start there and you can control it. It's all done on the same property, so there's better control over what everybody is doing. All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Clark. Okay, this is our last speaker. 
Hello. Could you give us your name for the record, please? Good afternoon. My name is Kaylin Everett. Um, I'm not a business owner or anything like that. Um, I'm just a petitioner. Uh, I was one of the people getting the, uh, the signatures for the petition. And um, I heard a lot of stories from the people who signed that petition, stories about their families who, who have been healed, how they stopped having seizures. And it's actually changed people's lives for the better. I, I didn't believe that until I started getting these signatures and started hearing these stories. I thought people just wanted to smoke marijuana and just to get high. But after hearing those stories from those people, I know that the CBD and this marijuana actually does help people. And, and it's more than money. And people really do need this medicine. So, I mean, there's that. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Okay, that will conclude the public comment regarding this matter. And I'll return to the board for comment and uh, action. Sure. Supervisor Gleason. Sure. Thank you very much. I appreciate everybody coming, and I appreciate, uh, sincerely appreciate um, your opinions, your perspectives, and uh, your ideas, and your activity in the public process. I have my uh, belief systems. I have my context from which I make my form my opinions. I'm going to share those with you so you understand uh, clearly where I'm coming from, and whether or not you agree with me or not is going to be your prerogative and the way you want to do it. So let me tell you what I see. I, in the world we live in today, I see a lot of shifting sands. I see President Trump making a comment the other day about, uh, offhand comment about um, possible changes in re federal regulations in marijuana. I see multiple ballot initiatives being presented. I haven't read them yet. I don't know their worthiness yet. I don't know whether I have issues with any of them yet. I don't know what's going on. But People are coming at this problem trying from multiple directions trying to solve the problem. I see an issue with numbers. I mean, we have a logical um, number that we derived at, which was somewhere around the 12,000 to 15,000. Let's give it a 25% margin of error. And I hear customer or, or business-oriented uh, people saying, that's just not right. I have 10,000 people I service in Ridgecrest. Well, if you're servicing 10,000 people in Ridgecrest, that's one out of every four people in that city and I dare say that that can't possibly be an accurate number of people who have a medical need. And that's just a perspective, just from looking at it from my, my angle, you, you, that's 25% of the people. Uh, I see today's news that the FDA made a decision, whereas they, uh, they, for the first time in our history as a nation, the FDA regulated, say it was okay to use something marijuana related as, a, as an approved uh, medicine. I hear this afternoon's presentations during public presentation today. I heard all you people bickering about things that were just, um, in my mind, not customer oriented. You were bickering about businesses and uh, stuff that um, really are not driving me as a decision maker. And, and not helping me as a decision maker, focus on the patient, which is my focus. How do I deliver a, in this shift, in this, within these shifting sands, how do I create a program that, can I create a program that will deliver reliable medication where I know the prescription, I know the doctor, or the, I understand how the prescription was, or the, uh, whatever they call the, the marijuana card was, was created, the quality of the product and the delivery. How do, I, how do I get in there and do that and help that person who's in need? So my focus, that was my context. My focus is trying to you know, find out whether or not we can create a system that has integrity um, and that can be, uh, I can have confidence in and my constituents can have confidence in and that it's reliable and that has minimum liability and uh, delivers a quality product to a person in need with adequate medica uh, mitigations for all, children, uh, schools, churches, all that stuff, all those people. How do we do a system and maintain public safety? H how do we do that? I mean, that is, good, that is a challenge in and of itself. And most of all, my, as I said earlier, my focus is on the patient. I need to be sensitive to the needs of that patient and can I do something or can I uh, create a system that will help uh, a, a a bona fide need, get them off opiates, get them into something that can have a positive impact in their lives and the quality of their lives. 
So that's the context, that's my focus. Um, what I'm seeing is, I got a couple questions. First of all, I, I see these changes in Avon and in um, California City, and they interest me. I mean, uh, they are providing on uh, a concept where they can deliver uh, from 10 facilities in uh, the east side of the mountains, or excuse me, the west side of the mountains in Avon, and four from Cal City. And those businesses, uh, permits have already been regulated and they, the local jurisdictions are managing them. Is that correct? That's correct. And both of those jurisdictions would be growing, testing, and requiring all the normal state licenses. So the, all the state regulations would apply. So if I, ha if I had a medical need for marijuana, and I lived in the Kern River Valley, and I'm a greater distance from um, uh, Cal City than I am from Auburn, they're both you know, an hour, over an hour to get to where I am, and I need a dosage, a monthly dosage, or I can get a month dosage, or I can get a delivery of a two-month dosage, or three-month dosage. If, I'm, if I, we go with that, so those delivery systems. That's correct. Whatever the rules are, and um, um, they, uh, those regulations, both of those jurisdictions are actually going above and beyond the state regulations. So, uh, so if we were to go with your option one, which is to make no change to our ban, maintain the ban we got it, as we have it, we would have a, right now we have until November 24th, existing legal non-conforming entities that can deliver or that can provide medical marijuana to these patients. And after that, we can have those medical patients, you know, Mick Gleason living in Kern River Valley, I can get a delivery of my medicine from one of these entities legally. That's correct. That would be the proposal. Not only that, I can grow six plants. Correct. Or you can also, as a medicinal cannabis, you could uh, become part of a collective that does not have a storefront where someone who does know how to grow can grow it and provide it to you as a gift, nonprofit. And I can have a friend grow it. Correct. So I have a way, multiple ways, if I'm a med uh, in need of medical marijuana, of having my medicine delivered to me, if we, if we approve option one, which is to no change to the band and don't support any of these storefronts, dispensaries, I as a patient can still get ready access to marijuana. Correct? Correct. Thank you very much, appreciate it. Uh, one thing I've learned and I believe that um, I don't trust this industry. I've heard all of you talk. I don't uh, care for uh, many of the things I hear. I don't have believe in the integrity of the system. I believe that there are patients in need and I believe that marijuana can deliver a quality um, um, medicine, but I don't believe that the industry is mature enough to uh, deal in a, in a, without the, fra the fraud that I see rampant in the industry. Um, and I would prefer, if at all possible, for Kern County, the good name of Kern County, to remain out of this business. So I voted before to ban it, and I'm going to vote now to uh, and make a motion to support option one of staff's recommendation. Thank you. Colleagues, who else would like to comment? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Nations, could you... Could you elaborate on um, a little bit about this? The, you said that you have a meeting, I believe, uh, scheduled to, to talk about strategies for enforcement. I mean, essentially what my concern is, is that we um, have not been effective in um, enforcing the ban that we put in place. And um, a lot of that has to do with the process, the civil process. And so are, we, are you hopeful that we are going to be able to to um, establish some additional strategies because I have the community of Rosamond that has um, at least a dozen, sometimes upwards of 20 dispensaries and I, I know that they're not um, serving the Rosamond population, um, that it is the Lancaster and Palmdale's um, folks, LA County folks that are coming in. And so what, what can those communities expect from us in the future? And the reason I ask that is if I set if, if I voted to set a limit um, of any sort, how would we, um, how could we be sure that we could enforce that? 
Up until now, the effort in Kern County on enforcement has been in the civil arena, and it has been very slow, and the results have been spotty for a number of different reasons. Uh, the Sheriff's Department has indicated to me that it has located resources that would allow it to uh, take these on in a criminal context, uh, using search warrants and seizure, and shutting down the dispensaries that are operating in violation of our ordinance and operating without any kind of state license. So um, I can't tell you the parameters of that, but um, at this point, because we have not heard from the Sheriff's Department how it's going to proceed in that regard, uh, we're meeting with them Friday to, to get the details on that. But that, <clears throat> it would be an operation very similar to what the city of Bakersfield undertook, um, involving uh, get, getting search warrants issued by a judicial officer, executing those search warrants, seizing Ill illegal material, and then uh, letting the matter proceed through the criminal court. Okay, thank you, Mr. Nations. Um, the, the Eastern Current communities, Roseman and Mojave and Tachope, um, from my perspective, um, have indicated that they do not want dispensaries in their, um, in their communities, um, particularly with the type of saturation that we've seen in Roseman, and I think that it's been um, probably the most um, talked about uh, public safety concern um, in, in the Roseman community. Um, when you go to town hall meetings or et cetera. Um, I would like to, I'd like to see if we are going to be more effective in, um, in enforcing um, before I take any action to, um, to allow a certain number or not. Um, and also I think that the variables that have been introduced as far as California cities consideration and Arvin um, create an even, um, and also the, the initiative that is going to go on the city of Bakersfield's ballot in November, and then the possibility of those going on the ballot for the unincorporated Kern County communities, um, either one or two. I think that, that introduces a lot of um, a lot of things that we, I believe, should consider before we move forward on a recommendation from the, from the committee. And so, um, I will second the motion um, that we maintain our current ordinance that uh, Supervisor Gleason made. Thank you. Could you provide us with the uh, ballot language that the city of, will be on the city of Bakersfield ballot? I have not read that. Uh, I haven't either. We, we, I, I asked elections for it and they have not yet received it. Um, I believe one of the authors is here today and he might be able to enlighten you, but I think it's very similar to the, the language that was submitted to the county um, in, the, in the Jarvis Epps uh, in, initiative, but I, I'll have to get the language to you later because we have not yet received That's it. That's right. Thank you. I'll be supporting the motion. Thank you. Uh, first of all, um, Ms. Oviat, does, uh, if we elect, if we decide not to proceed with option number two, the establishment of a limited number of, of uh, dispensaries, does that, does it require any action on our part to allow the existing ban to continue? Is, is a vote or a motion even necessary if we do not choose option two? I, I defer to county council, but the answer is no. No action is actually required. County council, can you confirm that? Is that, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you. So I'll leave it to the maker of the motion to see if that's necessary to, to do or not. But if we don't choose option two, then I don't think there's any reason to take action regarding option one because option one just states the current status, which is that there is a ban in Kern County. So, Ms. Oviat, would you, uh, let me state a couple of statements to set a platform and then I'll ask you for a couple of questions. Uh, no matter how many times it's said, um, no matter how many allegations there are that I have a conflict, I do not have a conflict. A political contribution is not the basis of a conflict. Um, a, a fellow who, I won't say gentleman, a fellow who has a criminal past has given every assurance in public that he will smear me, that he will speak ill of me, that he will uh, try to, to take me down politically um, over this issue. I can't stop him from doing that. Uh, but that, no matter how many times he says it, no matter what allegations he makes, that doesn't make them true. They are not true. And if they 
There's no evidence that they're true because they it hasn't occurred. So uh, I, I won't be silenced. I won't be denied the, uh, the, the role that the people of our community elected me to have to represent them. I won't be bullied by it. I, I will continue to speak on behalf of my constituents uh, and do so as long as I am in elected office. Uh, next, um, Ms. Oviat, the issue of uh, delivery in, into our uh, various communities of Kern County from Arvin, emanating from Arvin, do those deliveries allow for the delivery not only of cannabis but also of other cannabis-related products such as CBD oil? They do, Chairman Maggart. And is there uh, any community in Kern County which, according to Prop 64, can prohibit those deliveries from being made uh, on public highways? Uh, no. According to Prop 64, you cannot prohibit the use of public highways through your city or into your city or your county for delivery of uh, cannabis products. Uh, how long is it that, uh, just for the a matter of clarity, how many medicinal uh, marijuana dispensaries are currently grandfathered and allowed uh, under our grandfathering or amortization process to be in operation today in Kern County? Right now the number is 31. 31, thank you. And by when uh, they are grandfathered until a certain date to this amortization period as has been referred to, what, what is that date, November what? November 24th, 2018. So there are 31 dispensaries in Kern County available today that where patients can get medicinal right. cannabis or, or related products. Um, at, when we get to November of 2018, could this board consider whether or not it might grant an additional amortization period that would allow those to stay open a longer period of time? Is that an option that is before this board? Uh, that is an option your board has placed into the ordinance. There is a clear pathway by which they, by a certain time, they have to request um, an extension. I will be pro creating an application for that because there's financial information that they need to provide that shows that during this year, the amount of money that they put into their building permit and bringing things up to code, they were not able to recoup that money and they need to operate for some period longer. And there are specific time limits in the ordinance by which they must apply and by which I must answer that question. Mm -hmm. Then if they disagree with my determination either way, I say yes, I say no, uh, they can appeal it to your board. Thank you. <clears throat> on, on the day that we voted to ban uh, marijuana in Kern County and all of its forms in the unincorporated areas of Kern County back in October, that very same day, the four members that you see before you today expressed a concern that medicinal marijuana be made available to, continue to be made available to patients who need it. Uh, and uh, the result of that is in December, this uh, subcommittee was formed on which uh, Supervisor Gleason and myself have served, and uh, we took it as our charge. We explained, uh, I think, very clearly that our, our concern is not who delivers or dispenses or makes available to the public uh, medicinal marijuana, but that it be made available to uh, those patients who need it in Kern County. I think uh, after hearing the uh, prospect that there will be delivery available from um, the city of Arvin, that there will be dispensaries in Eastern Kern available from, Kern, uh, from Cal 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 California City, uh, almost said Kern City, from California City, <laughs> uh, from the uh, prospect that there may be a number of dispensaries uh, that result in the greater Bakersfield area. Uh, from the initiative that is before the city of Bakersfield, from the fact that there are currently 31 uh, dispensaries available to, to make medicinal marijuana available uh, and, its, and its byproducts. For all of those reasons, m medicinal marijuana is available in Kern County to patients who need it. And uh, in light of that, and with the, the changing landscape that we see, uh, we, we can always decide later, can we not, that we want to uh, um, assure that there are um, dispensaries available that can, a, a brick and mortar store that can make this available. Is that not the case, Ms. Oviat? Uh, that's correct. Is that not the case, Mr. Nations? That is the case. Thank you. With that being said, then, I don't think today is an appropriate day for us to proceed with option number two, and therefore, I'm, I'm comfortable leaving uh, the situation as it is. So, you made a motion, Mr. Uh, Gleason. Does that 
I don't know that that motion is necessary. What, what is your pleasure about that? Uh, I'll rescind my motion if there's no need for the motion. Are you fine with that? There's a second of them. Okay, is there any other discussion about this matter? Anybody want to say anything else about it? Ms. Oviat, thank you. Thank you to the public for being here. Uh, obviously, this is a very charged issue, but uh, I'm confident that medicinal marijuana remains available to patients who need it in Kern County. Next up on our agenda is, um, I believe, Madam Clerk, that concludes our agenda for the afternoon. Motion to adjourn. Mr. Thank you very much. When will we next convene? July 10, 9 a.m. in this room. So uh, we have a motion from Supervisor Scrivener to adjourn for the day without objection so ordered. Thank you very much.